Good morning. Uh, this talk is the future of Plone theming. I have Plone in brackets because I'm not going to do only things specific to Plone, but also talk a little bit about front end development in general. My name is Chrissy Wainwright. I work for Six Feet Up. I've been there for about six and a half years, and before that, I'd never heard of Plone, but I've been working with Plone ever since then, uh, and have created dozens of themes. And um, you know, excited to see what's going to be happening in Plone Five. So first, let's look at um, some things that change in Plone Five. One is that Diazo is now the default theming story. So any default uh, or the default theme will be Diazo, the Plone theme that Barcelonetta, and any new create newly created themes should be done with Diazo. And I'll talk a little bit about this uh, in a few slides. Another thing is that Portal Skins now becomes deprecated. So um, the type of theming that was done before Diazo, uh, generally called like a traditional Plone theme, was mainly a skins theme that used skins. So the skins are still there for now, but everything is being moved out of them. Um, so in Plone Core, the idea is, hope maybe after, even after this weekend, that nothing will use skins anymore. But if you have a theme or a product or something that still uses skins, um, it will still possibly work in Plone 5. I mean, there are probably other things you'd need to fix as well. But the skins will still be there. So all of the, the Plone templates that were in skins are being moved into browser views. And that's another thing that uh, we'll hit on a little bit, talk about that a little bit more. So as I said, Plone, Plone 5 has a brand new theme. This is what it looks like. Didn't show up so well on that screen. Um, but you can see the edit bar on the left. Uh, there will also be the option to display it at the top if you want. And uh, looking at this, like I said, this is a Diazo theme. So that entire section in the middle that says welcome, um, that whole banner, I think it's called a hero, hero bar. Um, that's just part of the theme. So if you start creating your own theme, you don't need to worry about even overriding that section because um, it's not actually part of Plone. That's just part of the Barcelona and Anna theme. Another thing that has changed is that uh, Chameleon is now used as the template language for the templates. Uh, if you already know Tal, you're pretty much set. It's very similar. Um, you know, a couple little things need to learn the differences for, um, but you know, not anything that you need to dig in and actually try and figure out how to use. It'll be pretty simple. And there are a lot of other things. You know, I'm not going to go over absolutely everything that has changed in Plone 5. Uh, but there's a demo site that is available. There's also the plone.org slash try5 that'll give you uh, the download. I don't think there's an installer yet. That's another thing that'll be worked on this weekend. Um, or if you're interested in seeing other changes, if you missed Eric's talk yesterday morning, uh, you know, one that's up online, go watch it because it had a lot of great information in it. And uh, you can help prepare Plone 5 with the sprints this weekend. I already mentioned a couple of these, uh, like the working on the skins removal, the Plone installer. Um, there'll also be one working on Plone 5 bug fixes, JavaScript, and, um, which is done with mockup. Uh, a couple sprints on products like collective.jbot and uh, Plone form gen using dexterity. So even if you're not technical, you know, still, if you're available, come to these sprints. It's a great way to learn more about the community uh, and, and you know how everything works. Um, you know, if you're not technical, you can still provide input, uh, test whatever people are working on, write documentation if needed. Uh, and there is also a marketing sprint going on this weekend. So now we'll look at how you can future-proof your Plone theme. Uh, this is this applies to new and existing themes. Um, basically, the idea is. You know, if you have a traditional theme, you can update it to be a Diazo theme. Um, but if you are creating a brand new theme, I would definitely follow all these steps. But for an existing theme, you don't necessarily need to follow all of the steps, but you know, just be aware of what changes are going to be happening in Plone 5. So um, you want to make it a Diazo theme, use Plone default as the base theme, reduce the number of template overrides, and turn skins templates into view templates. Uh, and I did write a blog post that was just published this morning. There's a references slide at the end that'll link to that. Or you can go to sixfeetup.com. So first, uh, make the theme a Diazo theme. 
You know, if you already have a traditional theme, it's really not too hard to turn it into a diazo theme. I have done this. Uh, it didn't take too terribly long. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with what diazo is, it is a method of mapping dynamic content to a static theme, the dynamic content being um, what you're grabbing from Plone and just putting it into um, basically a static HTML page. I, for myself, uh, I use zopescale.diazo theme for the boilerplate. It's um, just a command that allows you to, to create the diazo theme folder structure for you, and then you can just add it to your build out. And the diazo theme, it's a folder that's basically a browser resource uh, within the theme. And then Plone app theming, which is the, the product uh, that it's just the product that displays this directory as the theme in your Plone site. Uh, use Plone default as your base. Uh, you may not necessarily want to update your existing theme to this, um, but if you're creating a new theme, I would do this. Because uh, in Plone 5, you know, Plone, Plone default is going to be you know, the base there, you can't, because if you're creating a diazo theme, you can't make it based on another diazo theme, you know, unless you're like copying and pasting everything. Um, but, you know, what I'm trying to say is in the theming control panel, you can't have two diazo themes active at the same time. It's going to be one or the other. Um, so, you know, don't use Sunburst. That, this is the Plone 4 default theme, you know, if you're familiar with that. Um, but, you know, with all the changes happening, I would recommend going with Plone default instead. The, the nav bar that um, I showed on the left on that one screenshot, that, that will be styled even if you're using Plone Default. Um, for one, Plone Default starts with some base styles. It's not like currently when you go look at an unstyled site and there's absolutely no styles at all. Um, there is at least a starting point now. And the nav bar will be untouched by your diazo theme. So any styles that you write in your theme um, won't affect that nav, that nav bar on the left. It'll still look the same. And then the, uh, the last thing is that the, the main template is going to be updated. I've looked at it. It looks very clean. It's very nice. It uses a lot of HTML5 elements. Um, they've taken out a lot of the extra divs that were in there. Um, so keep in mind, you know, if you're upgrading a theme, if you happen to use selectors in your CSS that were like div pound portal column 2, uh, that's no longer going to work because that's now current, going to be an aside instead of a div. So, but I don't recommend adding the element name to your selectors anyway. Next would be to reduce the number of template overrides. And this includes ones within skins and z3c.jbot. You know, with Diazo, it allows you to, um, to make a lot of the changes that you need to templates just with a single rule. You know, in the past with traditional theming, I know I've overridden many, many templates just to, to change the title in a link. Um, so I would go through all of the overrides that I've written, see what change I actually made to it, you know, why I did that override, and then see if I can do it with Diazo instead so I can just remove that override. Um, the, the reason you'd want to do this is that Plone, uh, it's a lot easier to upgrade when you don't have to manage all of those template overrides. Um, also, a lot of templates are going to be re relocated in Plone 5. Like I mentioned, um, anything that's in skins is going to be turned into a browser view. Uh, so that move is going to move the location. Uh, so even if you do still have template overrides, once you upgrade to Plone 5, you know, you're still going to need to uh, make some changes there to, to manage those. Uh, so if you do still have to override a template, I would make a note um, at the very top of the template is what version that came from. So if it was like um, from Plone App Layout Viewlet's version 2.3.11, you know, make a note at that top. That makes it a lot easier that when you are upgrading your Plone theme, uh, to compare changes um, between versions of Plone App Layout. Uh, so now how to create view templates. Um, this does require a little bit of configure.zcml, um, but what I've found, you know, I've, I've really been embracing browser views here recently, especially in use with Diazo, and I'll show you um, down at the bottom, except you may not be able to see that. Let's see if I can fix that. So you, uh, to create a view template, so in your browser configure.zcml, you have um, it's a browser page. I'll, I'm going to go through each of these lines, um, well, for the most part. So four equals star and permission at the bottom, so two equals view, basically, um, you know, makes it globally viewable. Anyone, anyone can see this. That, um, 
you know, different things you can do with that, but I'm not going to go over that part. The important parts uh, are the name of it. So in this example, I'm just saying name equals home page. You can name that anything you want. Hopefully, it, you know, don't name it something that is the same as something else. Um, so you can also name it specific to your theme, like my site dot home page, something like that. Make it might make it a little bit easier to find in the future. And then the next two lines, um, both of these are not necessary at the same time, the class and the template. If uh, you have some Python code that you need to write uh, behind the template to make some things work, that you would specify that in the class line. And, and from that view class, you can also specify which template you're using. So if you're doing that from the class, um, then you don't need that template line. But if you are creating a, a view template that is template only, that doesn't have any extra Python code behind it, uh, you can take out that class line and just specify the template that you're going to use. Uh, the reason I would recommend doing this instead of creating the template in um, just as static HTML and Diazo is because uh, here you can use Tal, you can use um, you know, a lot of things that are already available within Plone, just like you would see in like a, any, any viewlet or any other template. Uh, you can also use this for, for viewlet type templates, like if you're creating some sort of uh, auxiliary navigation up in your header, uh, you can do use this for that. Um, and the nice thing with uh, what you can do with Diazo is in, you don't have to actually make it a viewlet. You don't have to um, specify it in the viewlet to XML. You don't have to um, add it to a viewlet manager. You can just pull it directly in with, Di uh, with Diazo. Let me see if I can fix that. Yeah. Um, so at the bottom there, I have a rule uh, replace. So in CSS theme, I have some um, div or something that I'm going to, to use to place the content. And the important part at the end there is the href. It's falling off the end, but um, what I have there is href equals slash at at home page. And that home page is the name of the view template that I specified up there in the ZCML. So I don't have to write any Python code or, or an upgrade step or anything to actually apply that home page template to a specific page in the site. I can just use Diazo to grab the content from that template. Um, and I've found this to be, to be really handy for viewlet type things, um, also templates like the home page like this. Uh, and you can also use it for macros if you have a template that you have uh, a bunch of code that you want to reuse a lot. You can still use it as macros just as you would in skins. Uh, and it's, you know, if you're familiar with using macros, you still reference it the same way. Uh, you know, use macro context slash template name slash macro slash macro name. Uh, so now we'll look, um, get away from Plone a little bit and talk about, you know, what changes are happening with the internet. You know, what are the supported technologies, browser usage, and we'll look at responsive themes a little bit. So the current supported technologies, uh, we have HTML5, CSS3, SVG images. Um, I haven't used those a whole lot yet. Um, but for each of these, you know, if you are curious as to what you can actually use across all browsers, I recommend using caniuse.com. Uh, you know, all you have to do is type in, um, you know, like if you want to see where you can use CSS transitions. You know, it'll tell you exactly what browsers support it, if there's partial support or anything. Uh, mainly, you're going to run up to, into issues in Internet Explorer 8, you know, especially of the, a few of the things that you learned from Rob yesterday. Uh, you're going to have issues in IE8. Uh, so let's look at the actual browser stats. Um, you know, do you actually need to code for IE8? Uh, well, these right here are the stats. These are the United States stats for May of uh, last month. Chrome is way up there at the top at about 35%. Next is Firefox, uh, Internet Explorer 11, Safari, iPad, and then IE8 and IE10. What was the next one down? IE9. Uh, and if you look at the, at the global stats, um, also for May of last month, they pretty much look the same. Chrome actually jumps up to 45%. Um, but you can see here the biggest problem is IE8. It is, it is still used quite a bit. Uh, but the best way to get an idea of what you need to, you know, use what you use for your site is look at your site's analytics. Like if you have an existing site, you're going to work on a new theme or something, um, hopefully your site already has analytics in place that you can then, um, 
you know, see what your users are using. So, you know, if you go look and no one is using IE8, you know, don't worry about it then. Fortunately, IE6 is dead. Um, officially, you know, it was the browser used for Windows XP, which is Microsoft now, long, now no longer supports. Um, but still, you're probably still going to need to use some fallbacks for some of the older browsers. Um, and that's okay. Your site does not have to look the same in every browser. I know some people are really picky about that. Um, but, you know, make sure it looks really good in the current browsers uh, and is still usable uh, in the older browsers. So responsive themes. Um, these are pretty easy to impl implement. If you've ever seen any of uh, Rob's talk talking about responsive themes, I mean, really all you're doing in your CSS is adding a media query saying, hey, if the browser is less than 800 pixels wide, then use these styles. Uh, you know, that's the, the basic part of it. Now, the idea is that you don't need an entire separate site or an app for, for mobile. You can use the exact same site, just adjust the styles a little bit, um, you know, and not have to manage two completely separate things. Uh, the important thing that you need is the viewport meta tag. Uh, it's just a meta tag. Um, I remember, but it has a viewport on it. Uh, if you don't have that in place, then your mobile browsers will try to display the entire site, you know, on just squished down as opposed to um, how you're using your responsive design. Um, so you can do the entire thing with CSS. Uh, for all of the ones I've done, I just have a tiny bit, like, you know, just a couple lines of JavaScript for a navigation toggle. Because uh, once you get down to those mobile browsers, you don't want to display your entire navigation up at the top, you know, having them scroll. You can hide it, just an, um, add a little button so that when they click that, it would then open up the navigation. And, I've, and that's all the JavaScript I usually need. Um, I have taken a few, few designs that were just a fixed width and uh, converted them to responsive themes. The last one I did took about 13 hours of development time, uh, which really isn't too bad. As far as Plone goes, there is nothing special that needs to be done. It, it'll just work. Uh, I've only had some issues on a couple sites that, for some reason, the responsive design wasn't quite working right. And all I had to do was split out those CSS files um, and then specify the media query in the CSS registry. There is, you can do that in the, uh, the media field. But as far as those particular ones, I don't know why they didn't work there. But most responsive themes I've done, you can just add the uh, responsive design in your main CSS. Uh, so now we'll look a little bit about um, you know, optimizing your site, the theme, because uh, we still want everything to load quickly and work well. So as far as CSS and JavaScript optimization, you know, even if you're using a Diazo theme that has your CSS and JavaScript files there, still put them all in the resource registries. You know, those are there because they provide um, merging, they merge the files together, remove some white space, and also provide some caching. And all these things are going to, to speed up your site. Um, and then I would go through those registries and order the CSS and JavaScript files um, in a way that will make as few requests as possible. So if you go to those registries in the ZMI and look at the merged composition tab, um, you know, assuming you're in production mode and not in uh, development mode, it'll show you exactly how all of the files are merged together. And so you may see, you know, okay, um, here's one that doesn't have any conditions, here's one that's for authenticated users, and then another one that doesn't have any conditions. You know, if you swap those last two, that's going to make less requests because, um, you know, it's going to merge that one up with all the others that doesn't, don't have any conditions. Um, I did this on a site recently for their JavaScript and was able to reduce the number of JavaScript files loaded from 12 down to 5 just because they had so many things in there and they weren't really optimized very well. Um, and so the, um, the way the merge composition works is it still goes from top to bottom for all the files in the registry, but if there are any that have the same conditions, it groups them together. Um, so if you're going to do that, you know, of course, don't necessarily test that on your production site. Test it locally or on a testing site first. Make sure it doesn't break anything in your site and then, um, and then apply it to production. Uh, there's image optimization that you can do. You can use image sprites, and basically what this is is, you know, instead of um, using 
a single, single file for each icon that displays in your site. You can combine them all into one single image and then with CSS specify um, you know, where, how that image is positioned. So that can reduce a lot of requests as well. Um, it doesn't work to only just work for uh, icons. I've also done it with backgrounds. So like, I mean, even if you have several um, backgrounds on your site that are use repeat X, you know, you can group all those into one single file as well. Uh, use CSS instead of images where possible. You know, like we, what we looked at earlier is that with CSS3, you can do a lot, um, like with board, um, rounded corners, shadows, things like that, um, that will work in um, all of our modern browsers. And then I also recommend using jpegmini.com and tinypng.com just to reduce the file size of your images. Um, I've had pretty good, good success with both of those, uh, reducing my file size, like some, usually between 30 and 60% without losing any quality. Uh, so they work out pretty well. All right, does anyone have any comments or questions or maybe things to, to mention on Plone 5 that I missed? Can you come up here, Chris, please? Is there a way to change the style of the nav bar? I believe so. I haven't played around with that yet, but um, I think I glanced at them briefly, and they do use browser resources. So there is a way that you would be able to override those, probably with c3c.jbot. Do you know, Eric? Sorry, I missed the question. Um, changing the styles of the nav bar, the new nav bar in Plone 5. Yeah, you can. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have a good answer on that yet. Okay, no good answer on that yet, but. Um, yeah, you should be able to, I would think you'd be able to override those. Like I said, I think they just use browser resources. Okay, any other questions? Okay, well, I'll make sure that these slides are online. I do have um, a final slide that has a bunch of resources um, of things that I talk about today. Um, also a blog post that I just uh, published today as well. Um, so that's all I've got. Thank you.